Well, thank you, Robin, for that introduction and also for um, submerging us in Dante, and it's where it's always a pleasure to be. And I'm, I'm very grateful to both Robin and Lucia for including me in this conference, and I'm very much looking forward to this conference, and I'm sure that every sentence I'm about to say will have to be retroactively qualified once I hear the other presentations, but since I haven't heard them, I have to obviously speak uh, with patience and, and wait until I hear them. So what I want to speak about uh, this morning is the way in which beauty presses us to a greater concern for justice or a greater concern with the diminution of pain. Both beauty and justice have in English a shared synonym, which is the word fairness. We speak of fair vistas and fair faces and fair skies, but we also speak about a fair playing field and fair arrangements. It may be surprising to remember that the word for fairness in the realm of justice, that is fair practice and fair play, come etymolo etymologically from the aesthetic realm, from the word for fairness meaning loveliness of, counten of countenance or perfection of fit. Um, that is, one might have thought that fairness in the realm of justice would come from the realm of the market fairs and exchange and so forth, but it doesn't. It actually does come from the aesthetic word. It's also the case that both beauty and justice have injury as their opposite term. In the case of justice, this is literally the case. The second syllable of injury is the same root as in the word justice. And injury, I believe, is the most accurate opposite for the word beauty. Sometimes I've been faulted for never having used the word ugliness in my book on beauty and being just, but that's because I don't quite comprehend what the word means, whereas I understand very well what the word injury means, and it seems to me to be positioned um, at the opposite pole from beauty, even though they will often find themselves um, companions. When we speak about beauty, whether a poem by John Keats or a novel by Emily Bronte, or a painting by Matisse or a lover's face, or a mathematical proof or the structure of the atom, we are always speaking about one of three different sites. And um, I want to just outline them for you because I want to then go through and talk about the way in which fairness in the realm of, of justice turns up in each of those sites as well. So sometimes when we're speaking about beauty, we're really talking about the beautiful object, let's say a vase and the various attributes it has, or, or a painting like the one uh, that we saw on the screen. And the, it may have various features such as symmetry or color or clarity or vivacity or unity. But sometimes when we speak about beauty, we're not talking about the object itself. We're talking about the um, response it evokes in a, in a viewer. And we have hundreds and hundreds of accounts of the response that beauty has elicited from viewers, such as, for example, uh, Plato's description in the Phaedrus of the way in which Socrates, coming into the presence of a beautiful boy, uh, breaks into a fever, a cold sweat, begins to make a fool of himself. He's falling over. His shoulder blades ache because he's beginning to grow wings, and so on and so forth. And we have very profound accounts of that immediate moment of coming into the presence of the beautiful. And then the third sight, again, um, affects the viewer rather than the object but rather than it describing the immediate response at the moment of being in the presence of the beautiful object, it describes a, a delayed response or the aftermath of beauty um, and the way in which it gives rise to the act of creation. So now I just want to go through each of those three again and just recall the way in which each of those presses us towards a greater concern with um, justice. So sometimes when we are speaking about the beautiful, we're speaking about a beautiful object, a flower, or a painting, or a poem, or a child's face. And attributes such as symmetry, or color, or plurality, or uni unity anticipate parallel, but much more difficult to achieve attributes in the realm of justice. And the particular um, example that I took in On Beauty and Being Just and that is still very important to me is the example of symmetry and the way in which symmetry in the aesthetic realm 
anticipates the account given by John Rawls in A Theory of Justice or, or his conception of justice as fairness when he writes that justice entails a symmetry of all our relations to one another. Now, I use the example of Rawls, but I could have used any theory of justice because as far as I'm aware, there is no theory of justice that isn't founded on the idea of symmetry. So, for example, we can talk about the need to have punishments that somehow mirror or are symmetrical to the crimes. Uh, or we talk about the way in which compensation ought to be symmetrical to the work that was carried out. And not only should work and its compensation be symmetrical, but the um, acts of work across five people ought to then be symmetrical among themselves to the compensation that those five are indeed receiving. Or we can go to a very different definition, say Hume's description of, um, of the, the uh, regulation of expectations and their fulfillment, where he's imagining that expectations and fulfillment have to somehow be symmetrical to one another. Um, so that would be an example of the way an attribute of beauty at the first sight, an attribute that uh, adheres inside the object itself, is anticipatory of an, uh, of an aspect that we try to then uh, bring about in the realm of justice. But the second sight is equally important, and often when we're speaking about beauty, it's not the object itself, but the um, response we have to the beautiful thing. And over many centuries in literature and philosophy, we have descriptions of this moment, and the one that is, to me, uh, most important, or maybe they're all equally important, but the one that is most striking to me, um, or most nearly hits home, is the one offered by two mid-20th century philosophers, Iris Murdoch and Simone Weil, who talk about the unselfing that comes about when one is in the presence of a beautiful object. That's Murdoch's word, unselfing. Or, to use Simone Weil's word, the radical decentering that um, takes place when you're in the presence of something beautiful. Iris Murdoch gives the example of being in a state of self-preoccupation, worrying about her work, worrying about whether her own status has been fully acknowledged and appreciated, and then suddenly seeing a bird, a kestrel, lift off. At that moment, all one's preoccupations go away, she says, and one undergoes an unselfing. Now, I call this, somewhat clumsily, a state of opiated adjacency. But the reason I like that term is because there are many, many things in the world that put us in a state of acute pleasure. And there are also many, many things in the world that make us feel lateral or marginal or on the sidelines. But there are very few things in the world, beauty's the only one I can think of at this moment, that actually do both simultaneously, that make us feel lateral or make us feel marginal or on the sidelines, and yet, put us in a state of acute pleasure at the very moment of um, being in that marginal or supporting uh, role. So obviously, none of us is at the center of the world, but obviously, too, each of us can get into the mistake of believing that we're at least at the center of our own world, and beauty relieves us of this <coughs> error. It not only puts us on the sideline, but makes us acutely happy to be there on the sidelines. Now the third sight of beauty is the sight of creation, and here again I'm talking about the perceiver, but the perceiver in the enduring moments after coming into the presence of what is, is beautiful. And again, we have many um, accounts over many, many centuries that validate this idea of the beautiful as giving rise to the desire to create. So Diatima told Socrates, who told Plato, who tells us in the symposium, that being in the presence of the beloved gives rise to the desire to bring children into the world. But Diotima says that beautiful persons and things not only prompt the creation of children, but the creation of poems, plays, legal treatises, and <clears throat> works of philosophy. 20th century <clears throat> philosophers agree. What is it, Wittgenstein asks, 
that happens to us when we stand in the presence of a beautiful cathedral or boy or flower, and he answers, when the eye sees something beautiful, the hand wants to draw it. That is, immediately there is the desire to create. So, in, uh, and, and I should say that having recently had a number of times when I was in the presence of scientists or mathematicians who were speaking about beauty, I felt confident that uh, as I listened to them, I would for sure hear the first and second sights. You can't talk about math without talking about symmetry. Um, and, and, uh, but I wondered if you would hear uh, the, the third sight of creation coming up a great deal. And um, so one of those mathematicians, Robert Langlin, from the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, opened um, his talk on lecture on beauty by saying, math must be pregnant with possibility and endure for a millennia. So the idea that it must be pregnant with possibility was there in almost the first thing he said. And then Mario Livio, who's um, at the Hubble, as an astrophysicist at the Hubble um, telescope, said, described the way in which um, the solution to quadratic and cubic equations produced so many unexpected outcomes that mathematicians got very excited and in a high state of anticipation about all that would come forth once um, quintic equations um, became uh, available to them. Now, in talking about creation, I tend to use the very prosaic word um, replication rather than creation because creation immediately conjures up very monumental things, uh, that the, like some of the works that we've already heard described um, this, this morning. And those, for sure, are what we mean by creation. But when I talk about creation, I also want to include the fact that in our most everyday experience, the immediate response to something beautiful is to want to replicate it by telling a friend about it, by grabbing a passerby and saying, you know, look at the number of blossoms on that chestnut tree, or by uh, taking a photograph of it, or even by simply making sure that it stays within your field of vision for 10 minutes longer, or you repeat your visit to it. Um, and those, I think, are very continuous with the acts of creation that poets and um, great painters um, uh, carry out. So there may be very great outcomes, but the daily kind of flexing of the capacity for creation is there in, in, that, um, in that act. Now, the question I now just want to describe is, or the answer, or begin to answer, is how does that third realm of creation contribute to, uh, to the, the fostering of justice? And I think that there are, are two answers to that. One is that beauty may be either natural or artifactual. We know that. Beauty exists in a wildflower. Beauty also exists in a highly landscaped garden. So the first is the natural, the second the artifactual. But justice only exists in the world of the artifactual. It always requires human intervention and human work uh, to bring it into being. And anything, therefore, which puts us in touch with our own powers of creation is itself a contribution to the ongoing aspiration for justice. Uh, the philosopher Hume is among those who emphasize this point. He said that natural virtue needs to have some benign outcome in order to be good, whereas artifactual virtues or artificial virtues need have no immediately visible outcome since the mere exercise of our capacity for the artifactual is a good outcome. Merely by putting us in touch with this capacity, which, which is going to be so crucial in trying to bring about uh, labored interventions on behalf of justice or the diminution of pain, um, the, the, uh, being put in touch with creation is good. The second way in which beauty, by at once awakening us to our capacity for the artifactual, contributes to justice is simply that it is tied to the desire to bring more and more into the world so that there is eventually enough. That impulse towards plenitude has been given many names over many centuries. It's, I think it's what in part was understood by the word infinity or caritas, um, and I think that it's also what today we mean by the word distribution, 
that is simply that there should be enough of to be available to everyone. So this third site, that is the site of creation, is important because it incites us to the exercise of the um, artifactual that is needed in the realm of justice. And second, because it is bound up with the pressure towards distribution, the making of more and more, so there will be eventually enough. Now, I know that people coming to a gathering about beauty um, have a yearning for visual images, and I will soon put some on the screen. And I've so far abstained from doing so simply because I wanted the truth or untruth of what I said to be measured against whatever object each of you took to be an instance of a beautiful face or a beautiful landscape or a beautiful um, painting. But I, I want now to, um, to, to give, and, and, and the fact that there would be uh, you know, as many examples as there are people in the room is actually, I think, a very important feature of beauty, and that is its plurality. I think that when philosophers have tried to argue for a kind of unitary idea of, of beauty, they always have a hard time doing so because what they're arguing is, uh, is untrue. Um, to, to state it to state it much too crisply and, and falsely, but I'll leave it there for the moment. But let me just um, turn to some images um, simply and, and say again some of the features that I'm talking about. And in choosing the pictures, I was very tempted for today to take the photographs of Salgado, um, uh, Sabasteo Salgado. I don't know if he's going to come up in your lectures I know, but, but it, 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 his photographs are just exquisitely beautiful uh, <coughs> photographs of, of thousands of people in a state of migration in the present decade. And uh, they are ravishingly beautiful. In fact, they were criticized, at least in the United States and in France, I don't know about here, for being too beautiful given that they were about such suffering. Um, and, uh, and, and yet, I'm not going to use those I'm, I'm, because they would already load the argument in my favor. That is, they indeed have the attributes of beauty, and they indeed have the content of justice. And therefore, um, I, I, the argument would already be made for me. I also didn't, didn't de decide not to take images that were, um, could, could be said to lead to justice because they shock us out of our complacency. There are many artworks that do that as well. Um, so I've, I've taken very neutral, serene, contentless um, objects, and I, I simply want to use them, and, and um, if they, if, if, and, and to me they seem, as I say, compelling and unmistakable in their beauty, but if they don't seem so to you, you can just substitute Another uh, another example, and um, I think I'm going to lower the shade. Yes, that's good. I think that's okay, Robin. Yeah, because we we could see your image pretty well, but yeah, that's good. Good. Is that fine? Yeah, that's fine. So the feature of symmetry is richly apparent in Josiah McElhaney's Modernity Mirrored and Reflected Infinitely. Um, and, and this is a, a piece that, that is in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. It's a small cabinet in the wall. It's about 100 times as beautiful as this image seems to suggest. And there's always a small crowd of people around it. And when you go upstairs to look at something else and you come back down, you'll see that the pool of people is still there, although its membership may have changed. Um, there's also, McElhaney also has a, a piece in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston called Endlessly Repeating 20th Century uh, Modernity, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, but it, it, the feature of symmetry, I think, is richly apparent in this. Each vis vessel is itself balanced and exists in a balanced relation with each of the others. And um, the, the, there, there's a great plenitude of iterations. By the way, even in the glass vessels, the surfaces, the smoothness of the object bodies forth the attribute of symmetry. Um, Augustine said that, um, that our love of symmetry, among many other places where we see it, 
We see it in the tactile feature of smoothness because there's an equality of iteration across the texture um, of an object. But just as you can see symmetry in this um, piece, you can also see the feature of unselfing because one of its odd features is that though it contains many mirrored surfaces in the vessels in the front, the you yourself as a viewer are not pictured in the mirrored surface. So it's, it, you really have um, undone, you've disappeared despite the fact that you're confronting many mirrored surfaces. And so too, the third feature of replication is obviously being very um, emphatically reproduced here. So that even though I said that the second and third feature stand outside the artwork, of course, in the 20th century, the way artworks work is that they build into their interior the features that are um, not only their own formal features, but the formal features of the way that, that we look at them. Um, here is Shiro Kuramata's 1988 cha chair called Miss Blanche. It's one of 350 <coughs> chairs in the Museum of Modern Art, although this particular photograph was taken by Mitsumasa Fujitsuka from the 1998 tour of Kuramata's work by the Hara Museum of Contemporary Art in Tokyo. In its clarity, in what Aquinas called claritas, it seems to stand forth and break all frames of reference at the very moment that it conjures up a plentiful world. Um, it bodies forth its immediate namesake, Miss Blanche of Tennessee Williams' play, Streetcar Named Desire, the ever bright electric light of male and female sexuality. It is Kuramata's generous salute to Blanche Dubois, his assurance to her that she will never fade. If you remember the play, she's very worried about aging. Mitch in the play in scene six tells her, you're as light as a feather. And, uh, and, and uh, by this kind of salute, Kuramata relieves her of her weight, uh, just as the chairs in which we sit in this room relieve us of our weight, um, and, while, and, and also refuse to let her fade. So while the chair conjures up that kind of, of reference, it also conjures up many other references, many other precedents, such as the inlaid flowers of Joseph Hoffman or Rene McIntosh, um, particularly the embedded ivory roses of Rene McIntosh's white tables and chairs. And here I'm just showing the Kuramata <coughs> close up, but I, I think you probably know the, the McIntosh example. And going back further in time, I think that um, Kuramata's chair conjures up as well the tradition of 17th through 19th century <coughs> Japanese in-row boxes, tiny tiered compartments for medicine or cosmetics, with veneers or inlays of incrustations of poppies, clover, chrysanthemum, or wisteria. In the roses floating in plastic, there's a magical blend of the world of nature and a material that after 1950 was spoken of with contempt, namely plastics, a material that in our lifetime um, was raised to a kind of heavenly space and, uh, and, and that altered our relation to every other piece of plastic. That is, once a material has been used in a great artwork, it, uh, then it's, 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 it spills outside the boundaries of that artwork and actually alters our relation to um, many other things. But Kuramato's Miss Blanche, or other chairs by Kuramato, such as um, Glass Chair of 1976, which is made from six sheets of glass, you're here seeing it from the side. Or perhaps his best known chair, uh, which is called How High the Moon from 1986, are invoked this morning primarily for the general way the three sites of beauty process beyond ourself. One of Kuramata's commentators, Tadashi Yokoyama, makes the startling comment in speaking of Miss Blanche that the effects that come with sitting in the miraculous chair, that's his term, can be equally achieved just by looking at it. This is a, a, a strange claim about a chair. I, if, I, if I'm having trouble bearing my own weight, actually to sit on that chair is gonna relieve me of the weight much more effectively than to look at the chair. So it's a strange claim to make 
that, um, that the effect of the chair is brought about just by uh, looking at it. And, um, and yet it, 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 it reenacts this quality of unselfing of beauty um, that again makes it irrelevant whether it accommodates one's own body or not. That is just as the unselfing was apparent in the ease with which we adjust to the absence of our own reflection in McElhaney's modernity mirrored and reflected infinitely. Um, so in, in, in uh, these works, we adjust to um, the fact that we need not be personally um, accommodated. So in Miss Blanche or in Glass Chair or in this one, How High the Moon, the second sight of beauty is memorialized inside the work. So too, the third sight of beauty, the attribute of creation or replication is visible in How High the Moon. This is what Kuramato himself said about this chair. Um, this mesh piece expresses a plane that barely holds itself up after all excess parts have been subtracted from the board. This is why people call me a minimalist, but I sometimes also do the very opposite. When steel mesh is surfaced with chrome enamel, it shines and seems to proliferate I'm working out a process of subtracting and multiplying at the same time. The concept of decoration is weak inside me, but by using mesh that proliferates like a cell within the process of eliminating, I'm discovering my own style of decoration. So here again, there's a, a building into the object of the second and third sight, which we normally think of as, um, as belonging inside the, uh, to the, the site. So now of these three sites, the ones that um, people uh, often disagree with me about, the, the site that people often disagree with me about is the first site, the, the site in which the attributes of the beautiful object actually press us towards, towards beauty. Um, when I say that um, selfing is something we can immediately recognize or creation or replication is something we can at once recognize, um, if only in the very ex excitement we feel in seeing um, a beautiful artwork or reading a poem we haven't read before or rereading a section of a poem we haven't read for a long time. Um, then, but but the, the, uh, the attribute, the, the seeing the way in which the <coughs> attributes themselves of the beautiful object presses towards justice um, seem to, to be uh, more difficult. Or let me put it this way, when, when I, if I invoke Iris Murdoch, um, everyone I think understands I'm being literal. She was certainly being literal. She makes that point in the work called The Sovereignty of the Good and the question she's asking is, what is it in the world that makes us wish to be good? Not, she says, what makes us able to speak about being good or theorize about being good. What makes us actually act good? And she says, of all the things I know, um, of all things, it's beauty above all that does this. So she's, she's talking about a literal um, outcome. But when I speak about symmetry, people um, sometimes tell me that I'm being uh, metaphorical, whereas I believe that I'm being perfectly literal. And, um, and philosophers have on more than one occasion told me to give this up because I don't need it. But whether or not I need it, I think it's true and therefore I must persist in making the argument. So let me just um, elaborate for a moment the importance of an attribute inherent to the object such, such as symmetry. So first of all, we of course have many accounts from artists themselves talking about the importance of symmetry. And by the way, by symmetry I don't just mean bilateral symmetry, but duodecahedrons inside octahedrons and so on and so forth. And I don't mean that we can't ever break the symmetry because of course we do often break the symmetry to delight in the fact that we're capable of um, breaking away from the, the symmetry. Um, and the, uh, but, but, I, but I think that we only do that within, uh, within real constraints. For example, uh, people will sometimes point out that, uh, that, that very extraordinary models may have very um, irregular faces. But what people mean by irregular faces, some tiny little modification of an otherwise you know, splendid symmetrical face. And when people 
symmetry of faces is really hurt as if they have bone cancer of the face or an injury from a shell in Iraq, no one gets confused and thinks that what we're talking about is, is beauty. Um, but at any rate, the, we have lots of um, poets who have told us that symmetry presses us towards a concern with justice. For example, Wordsworth's Tintern Abbey, you'll remember his lines, these beauteous forms have not been to me as is a landscape to a blind man's eyes. And then he goes on to say what they have been. Um, they bring the kind of pleasure, quote, as have no slight or trivial influence on the best portion of a good man's life, his little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love. So the little, unremembered acts of kindness and of love, where did they come from? They came from the beautiful forms, seeing the beautiful forms of Tintern Abbey. And at the end of the 19th century, you have something very close, even though it's not nearly so well-known, um, a poem, and that's Thomas Hardy's poem at the lunar eclipse, where he looks at the surface of the Earth's shadow on the moon and thinks it's so beautiful and sees that its shadow has no equivalent in the realm of justice on Earth. So th these are the lines. Thy shadow, Earth, from pole to central sea, now steals along upon the moon's meek shine in even monochrome and curving line of imperturbable serenity. How shall I link such sun-cast symmetry with the torn, troubled form I know as thine, that profile, placid as a brow divine, with continents of moil and misery. So the, I think that, that the, the answer to the question about um, why we have difficulty seeing the connection between, say, symmetry in the realm of the beautiful object, a vase or a painting, and symmetry in the realm of justice is that there's often a big time lag between the two. And in fact, I'm not ever saying that um, you know, an artist who cares about beauty will care about pain, or, or, or a, a, an error that cares about beauty will care about pain. I'm saying that over the long run of human history, the constant presence of beauty helps call us to the work of repairing um, injuries in the realm of injustice. But the difficulty of seeing the connection um, can come about because the, um, the two are, are, are um, separated. And the, um, we've had accounts from that over many centuries. For example, Plato says that truth, beauty, and goodness inhabit the realm together, inhabit the world together in the immortal realm. And then he says, but beauty has a special generosity because it's also in the material world. And it's like a bright light leading us from the material world that's immediately sensorially apprehensible to the immortal realm um, where, the, uh, where they're not, um, where, where, where justice and goodness are, but where they weren't so easily apprehensible on, on earth. Um, and the, I think the simple way to understand that is simply that it would be, it's very uh, imagine, easy to imagine beauty being sensorially present within the space of the room, let's say in the very text, various textiles or cloth um, that are being worn today. Whereas justice never just refers to the relations of people among this room, but the relations between people in uh, Cambridge and people in Boston and people in uh, Diego Garcia, an island that Britain leased from uh, Mauritania and the United States leased from Britain and where some of US practices of torture have taken place. That is, it always involves uh, relations among people across a space that is not sensorily available in an immediately apprehensible bowl of, of space. So there are, I, this is, this is, there are gonna be two different um, reasons why there can be a time lag between the ease or speed with which beauty is immediately available and the long delay in, um, in, in the aspiration, in fulfilling the aspiration in the realm of justice. And by one account, we could say that the aspiration for these attributes in the realm of beauty 
comes about much more quickly in, uh, in, 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 the, in the realm of beauty than in the realm of justice. And then the second example I'll give is one where the aspiration comes about at the same moment, but the, uh, but the instantiation of it takes much longer in the realm of justice. So an example of it coming into being in the realm of aesthetics much more quickly than it comes into being in the realm of justice is um, St. Augustine's De Musica, where he talks about equality as the supreme attribute, a godlike attribute, and talks about the way it's visible in uh, dance steps and faces and uh, uh, colors and cakes. Uh, and roses, all these things, he says, have a quality. The reason he can see it in colors is because if this color stays the same across this surface, then you're seeing the, the, uh, the phenomenon of equality in the, the fact of, of color. Okay, so Augustine, though, is not, as far as I can see, talking about equality of races or equality of gender or equality across economic divide. Um, so he's not talking about what we would understand as justice, and yet by making this attribute of equality available as one of the highest attributes, as a godlike attribute, um, it, it's beginning to make it available to the, for these other understandings. And then the second um, account is the uh, recognition that you can sometimes have the two of them coming into the world together at the same time, but that you can't get, in the realm of justice, it's just an idea. You can't get it instantiated in the physical world. So take the fact of Plato talking about how crimes and punishments ought to be symmetrical. We can say, well, that comes into the same world as, that comes into the world at the same time that Parmenides is talking about the well-rounded sphere as the most perfect of all shapes. So in other words, the aesthetic and the principle of justice are there at about the same time. But the well-rounded sphere is there physically as well as an idea at the moment Parmenides is talking about it, whereas the relation between crimes and punishment uh, is taking centuries and centuries and centuries to figure out. For example, in the 19th century, Parliament in the UK did um, studies of all the crimes that were punishable by death. There were 200 crimes that, 200 crimes that were punishable and punished by the death penalty, um, and they were very. Some of them were very, very minor crimes. Um, and still today, we don't think. I don't think there's been a day since 9/11 in the United States when anyone thinks that we under have any understanding of what the relation is between crime and punishments how you react, I mean, do you injure a whole population of people for acts that um, some individuals have, have done? Or can you actually arrest somebody in a Chicago airport, as we've done, and hold them in a North Carolina um, cell without charge or without even, um, uh, without even uh, saying what, what the act of wrongdoing um, was? So I think that some of the reluctance about this feature of symmetry, and, and you know, the, I think it can, can show up in, it, it may be that some people are skeptical that symmetry is really at issue in justice. It may be that some people feel that symmetry, question whether symmetry is really important in aesthetics. Or it may be that they question whether, you know, given that it exists here and it exists here, is there actually any traffic between the two, as my colleague Charles Reed said, show me the trucks and trains going back and forth um, between those two. But I think that part of the reason that we're reluctant, at least in the United States, is because um, you know during the whole period that um, beauty was under taboo, which was for, for quite a few of decades, um, the whole principle of symmetry was also under taboo and is still under taboo. Because if, if we had to actually look at what was involved in symmetry, it would mean that we would have to go through um, many, many changes. Um, all of you know figures such as the fact that 1% of the world's people own 40% of the wealth, 
that 20% of the population owns 80% of the wealth. In the um, United States, the United Nations Human Development reported that, um, Office of, of Human Development reported that in 1820 there was a ratio of three to one of the richest to the poorest in the United States. By the year 2000, the ratio was 75 to one. And inside um, certain companies, the ratio of the CEO's salary to the poorest worker was 419 to one. And th that, so we know there are great asymmetries economically. And if we go to the world of weaponry, the world of uh, the asymmetries are um, even much more profound as, as I was <clears throat> outlining yesterday. So is it really the case that symmetry is boring, as so many people seem to say, or is it the fact that symmetry is terrifying in what it requires um, if we actually have to, um, have to go ahead and, and, um, and look at it? Um, Aristotle says in the Nicomachean Ethics, we see that all men mean by justice that kind of state which makes people disposed to do what is just and what makes them act justly and to wish for what is just. Um, I'll turn for a moment to a second feature that's inside the object um, and the way in which it presses us to justice and that is the, um, the vivacity of the beautiful object and the reciprocal vivification that comes about through our interaction that um, Robin began speaking about this morning, a kind of life pact that exists between us and uh, the beautiful artwork or the beautiful scene in nature or the beautiful friend, um, whatever. And the, the, um, an account of, of this kind of life pact that's very enduring is given by um, Homer in book six of the Odyssey where he describes Odysseus um, being washed up on shore and coming upon Nausicaa. And he describes Nausicaa all in terms of her newness or her newbornness. Um, and he has a sense that he's never seen anything like her in the world before, although he'll go on to find sacred precedence for her, just as in Kuramato's chair, we at first think we've never seen anything like this before, and then we can quickly begin to fill in all the precedents um, I was outlining. But his emphasis on the newness or new, newbornness of Nausicaa um, is one of the ways in which we see the salute to the feeling of uh, aliveness in beauty. And it comes out also in the fact that Odysseus has just been washed up out of the man-killing sea, so that there's a link being made in the text between beauty, the beauty of Nausicaa, and the feeling of the life saving, of, of having one's life saved. And there are countless other works that affirm this same idea. So Augustine in De Musica describes beauty as a life saving plank <coughs> in the midst of the ocean. And um, Dante wrote a book in response to seeing the beautiful Beatrice called The New Life. And Rilke, at the end of his poem about the archaic torso of Apollo, says, you must change your life. Um, so we can see that beauty is life-saving or life-generating narratively, as in the case of um, Odysseus or Augustine or Dante or Rilke. But what is it that literally is being referred to by this idea of a life pact? Um, and I, I think that there are two things that give us this sense that the beautiful um, brings about this, this uh, new life. And the first is that it repairs the ground we're standing on. It gives us a sense, uh, a restored trust in the, in the world. Um, and the second idea is that it raises us to a higher level of perceptual acuity or a more intense vivacity of perception. It raises the bar for what counts as perception. Um, the, and, and sometimes people will talk about how beautiful people or things rob all our perceptual energy and divert us away from other things. And I would say to my students, I teach a graduate course on beauty, try this experiment the next time you're walking down the street and you're su suddenly floored by someone's beauty. Ask yourself, were you 
walking along, generously paying attention to everyone you came upon on the sidewalk and the, the buildings and so forth, or were you basically not paying attention to anyone? And this sudden <coughs> confrontation with the beautiful person woke you up to what it means to be perceptually aware. And I think that that level of perceptual awareness then sets the bar for what we take to be um, to perceptual acuity, whatever we're looking at, or whomever we're, we happen to be seeing. Um, now, so far, it sounds like this life pact is one directional. Beautiful things, poems, paintings, photographs, faces, and math equations heighten our own aliveness. But in what sense does the reciprocal act occur? And I think the answer is this. It elicits from us a desire, and this is again something that, that Robin said in his introductory remarks, it elicits from us a desire to protect and take care of the thing if it's already alive, such as a garden or a stream, and it gets us to confer the privileges of lifelikeness onto the thing if it's an artifact that isn't actually alive. That is, if a painting is stolen from the Gardner Museum in Boston, or from the National Gallery in Berlin, um, we all have concern for the surface and well-being of that painting as if it were alive. Um, there, there is a kind of shared gasp of alarm over the fate of the thing. And the act of becoming the steward or guardian or protector of these works is carried out by museum curators and librarians and teachers but this act of stewardship is also carried out by the public at large very clearly. So this reciprocal conferring of aliveness is, I believe, a kind of life pact or life social contract in a way. Um, and the life pact um, has often been seen as a kind of, of greeting. And I will just show you a, a few more um, paintings. This is um, Bridget Riley's painting called Current from 1964. And there's going to be quite a few times from the, the paintings I show you for the next few minutes where I say, now, if you were actually in front of this painting, what would happen? But I promise you, if, what, if you were actually standing in front of this painting, it would be throbbing and pulsing, um, as everyone who's looked at it has said. But it's, and I'll explain in, in a few minutes why it's very hard to do with a photograph. It involves getting the light levels exactly right, which is not the fault of this room, it's the fault of my photograph. Um, but the, the idea of, of greeting, in part, comes from that, part, that, that idea that um, I cited from Plato, that the beautiful takes place in the sensory world and therefore comes down to earth to greet us in a way that goodness and truth don't necessarily do. Um, and the, the Plato referred to this uh, as clear discernibility, or in some of the translations, he will talk about the clear discernibility of, of beauty. And uh, I think that that is in part what prompts the idea of claritas that was um, celebrated by Aquinas. Um, and, and if you've read uh, James Joyce's uh, Portrait of an Artist recently, you may remember that when Stephen Dedalus and Lynch begin to discuss the aesthetics of Aquinas, Stephen lifts his cap in greeting. And it's, it's because of this idea of um, beauty being a greeting. Um, Ficino and Pseudo Dionysus talked about beauty as a call. That's again the idea of greeting. Dante's new life, the whole book is structured as a series of greetings uh, between Dante and um, Beatrice. And um, another a painting is where that's, that even though it has neutral content, seems when you're in the presence of the actual painting to greet us is Mondrian's Broadway Boogie Woogie. Uh, the neurobiologist Margaret Livingstone um, is somebody who works on two different visual systems in the brain. And um, she shows that one visual system uh, that processes color tells us what things are. Whereas another visual system that processes luminance level tells us where things are. And she points out that, um, that 
a painting like Broadway Boogie Woogie um, actually disables our wear system, uh, that is the process in our brain that uh, can differentiate luminance levels by making the paint color equal luminant. That is, in Broadway Boogie Woogie, the, if you're in front of the actual painting and not in front of the photograph, the yellows, the grays, and the whites, though they're different colors, are all at the same luminance level if you measure them very carefully with a, 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 meet, a, a meter designed for that purpose. And the result is that the thing will not stay in place. It begins to, to dance and do the Broadway um, boogie woogie. And Livingstone points out that many Impressionist paintings um, are equal luminant, even if it's a, a matter of an orange sunset in a gray sky, you think those can't possibly be the same luminance level. But they are, and it's the reason why the thing is pulsing and throbbing. And the, um, it's part of the reason why um, Monet's paintings of grass or poppies, um, as, as Livingstone writes, seem to, um, to, to greet us. And um, it's, it's also part of the reason why even paintings that are devoid of, they, they aren't, I mean, in, in Monet's paintings, he's clearly doing a mimesis of aliveness. Grass is alive. Poppies are alive. Women's skirts aren't alive, but in his paintings, they seem almost alive. But this has no aspiration to doing a mimesis of aliveness in its content. And yet, in the presence of the painting, when you're standing in the museum, it seems to greet you. Um, and it seems to greet you by bringing about this, this kind of fit between your perceptual apparatus and the painting itself. Um, and and that, that feeling of reciprocal fit is part of what I mean by the phenomenon of the, the greeting. The linguistic root of the word fairness is related to the word for fit, fit both in the sense of pleasing to the eye and in the sense of being matched as, one, as when one thing exists in accord with another thing's shape or size. Fit, in turn, is connected through the verbs fagen in Dutch and fagen in German, meaning to adorn and decorate, and through these words to the word fe and related words for pact and welcome. When you look at the stunning descriptions that have been given of Mondrian by various art critics, they will always emphasize the symmetry for sure. For example, some terms that I've found um, used by wonderful critics are aggressive symmetry, angular regularity, unyielding grids. Yet at the same time, those same critics will talk about the liveness, the aliveness, the glistening quality, um, the, the, the glistening fenestration, as one art critic um, writes of, of this. And the, anyone who's walked through a museum has actually, I'm sure, had the experience of being greeted by various, um, various paintings. This is one more uh, painting, and it's by Ken Noland. Um, and I went to the museum uh, yesterday and the day before, and hoping that the two Nolan paintings that are there, maybe there are more than two, but two I saw, would do the same thing that I'm going to describe, but they actually don't. Um, so you're going to have to go to the museum, uh, the Museum of Modern Art, to confirm the truth of what I say. But what I say, I assure you, is true. That when you look at um, the center of this painting, and when you're in front of the actual painting, and you um, stare at the black circle uh, at the center, the black circle and central dot remain, but the blue entirely vanishes, and even the gold almost vanishes. But then the blue, a moment ago gone, returns and begins actually streaming down the channel provided for it. The return and surging of this blue itself is full of surprise, and the blue that appears there is a blue that I myself don't recall ever having seen in my life before. Um, if I instead focus on the outer circle, luminous rings begin to orbit through them. This set of volatile chromatic events happen consistently each time I look at the painting when I'm in front of the actual painting. The painting seems to have once again intricate, intimate knowledge about the structure of my mind. In fact, it brings me into contact or enables me to feel graphically and palpably 
structures within my mind, <clears throat> colors within my mind that I didn't know um, were there. Um, now, in there's a, an additional section of my lecture in which I wanted to show <coughs> the way in which this pact of aliveness is available in ordinary everyday objects, though I use the example of great artistic renderings of those ordinary objects. But I can see that we're, um, that I'm actually at the time limit for speaking. And uh, what I don't want to do is uh, throw the whole timing of today's events off. So I think that I'll just stop there and hope that some other time I can uh, talk about the life pact of uh, beautiful things in, and the way in which it, it works it out in everyday objects. So thank you.